Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for the sixth annual ESS Summit. Uh, we've got a really, really exciting couple of days lined up for you um, in terms of content, networking, and lots more. Um, so just a reminder that the live content will be taking place today and tomorrow, and then also next week on the 2nd and 3rd of March. Um, however, the portal will remain open throughout the entire time leading up to these dates and also afterwards. So you're still able to arrange one-to-one -one meetings with other delegates, uh, view the recordings and also network during this time. As already mentioned, uh, we will have live support during this time. So if you are experiencing any issues with the portal, then please just get in touch. So before I hand over to Gerard, um, just a quick overview of what we've got lined up. So today we'll be starting with some presentations and keynote discussions around making money from storage uh, ancillary services and revenue stacking and then tomorrow we'll be focusing more on disruptive technologies in the storage sector along with some interactive workshops from our sponsors. Uh, the Trina storage workshop is open to everybody so I would um, encourage everybody to attend however the Vartzilla and EDF workshop are invite only so if you are interested please get in touch um, and we'll let you know. Um, we will also have some speed networking, one each day, um, so look out for them on your agenda and they're very, very simple to join. Um, so we hope you enjoy them. So just before I welcome Gerard to the stage to give us his insight on why storage is so important to the global transition, I'd just like to say a very, very big thank you to our sponsors for this event. We have our technology and industry diamond partner, Trina Storage, our platinum, platinum sponsors, Vartzilla and EDF. Our gold sponsor, Huawei, silver sponsors, Arenco Group and Sungrow Power. And then we have our bronze sponsors, Carbon Mutual Energy, Centrica Business Solutions, Chromalox, Hive Power, Leclanche Energy Storage Solutions, Lion Tamer, Saft, Siemens Gamesa, Watlow and White & Case LLP. Then, of course, we have our supporting sponsor, Honeywell, and our exhibitors, Inaccess and Ness. And of course, not forgetting our media partners who have helped make the event a success as well. So now, without further ado, I'd love to hand over to Gerard, who will be sharing his slides and his insights. Hi, Gerard, how are you? Very good, very good. Looking forward to this. Good. So if you'd like to kick off with your slides, I'll stop sharing. Good, okay. Okay, we're getting there. Can you see that? Yeah, all good. Very good. So, well, listen, but why am I doing this? Why am I here? I, I'm here because just, uh, I, I mean, I found Alexa Capital, uh, one of the co-founders of Alexa Capital seven, eight years ago. And actually what we sort of looked at and we said, well, what are the really important technologies going forward and what, how can we differentiate ourselves from the competition? And one of the areas we focused on was storage. And I suppose, when I was doing this presentation, I was actually really th sort of thinking back on why we actually started focusing on this storage eight years ago. And it sort of holds true still today, except today we've got much more, uh, I would say, momentum behind storage. So let me just kick off and just talk um, like three parts to it. And what I would do is I'll keep it sort of reasonably short. Uh, storage is all around us, cleaning up the fossils, because really storage is a critical part of that. And then how do we store electricity? And what I would just suggest is any questions you have, just I gladly take them at, at, your end, at the end. And if you want these slides or you want to reach out to me, feel free to, uh, to just reach out by email and gladly have a chat with any of you. So the first thing I want to say is that energy storage is everywhere. <laughs> Having said that, we, we take it for completely for granted, right? So we use it for the food we eat, starting there. I mean, food at the end of the day is energy. So you put it in a fridge, you put it in containers. If you don't do this, it rots. Yeah, you think you look around and you talk about how you store heat. So we store heat in the whole form of hot water. I have a greenhouse. Guess what? Why do I put a greenhouse around it? Because sun goes in and the, the glass actually keeps a lot of the, the, the sun's heat within the glass house, which is obviously very good for the plants. If I look at our digital world, sorry, can't survive without it. We've got batteries all around us. Um, and if I go beyond that, if I look at our power systems, quite interesting, our power system, um, also has storage in it, although we often think it doesn't, but it has, and it's called inertia. And the best way to describe inertia is you're on a bicycle, you stop pedaling and the bike continues going, right? There's still energy in it. 
And the result of this is that it's actually the way we keep our, our, our power grid actually balanced to this day is we use that, we use inertia, incredibly important part of, of, of our, our, our power system. But I also say as well that we've spent the last 300 years building up a massive fossil fuel storage infrastructure, which really, really are today critical to our infrastructure. And I'm not just talking about coal bunkers, but you just think of it in terms of the oil tankers that go across our world, the gas infrastructure that's put in place, really, really massive. But the bottom line is we live in a world where we have to stop uh, burning these fossil fuels. And um, and if you, if you live in a world where you have to stop burning these fossil fuels, you're gonna to have to do something in storage. Storage becomes suddenly really, really critical. And so let me explain why that is. So the bottom line is, it's really complex to change our uh, energy system. Uh, we're going through, an, uh, what we're trying to do is an energy transition that normally takes a generation. And we're trying to do it in 20 years. Uh, and this, and, and, and also we're trying to do this with a, a population that is 50% higher than it was 25% year, 25 years ago. So really, really significant. So, but I say, only way you can do this is to electrify uh, this, as much of your energy system as possible. And I explain why. It starts first and foremost with just efficiencies, right? Those of you who have an electric car, what you realize is your fuel costs are just much lower. And the reason your fuel costs are much lower is because what, you, what you've got in a diesel car, a gasoline car, is you're losing a lot of that combustion energy that you're converting into kinetic energy to drive the wheels. You're losing to heat loss, okay? You could put in an electric engine, guess what? You've got less heat losses, right? Very, very simple. Electricity is really, really easy to control. And if you think of it, if you could actually, the more and more you electrify stuff, what you do is you increase, uh, you, what you do is you decrease the, uh, the, the, the losses. Also, even around that as well, I would also say if you digit, the more and more you digitalize and able to control this, also same thing that you can decrease the, the amount of waste in the system. And the waste actually is money, right? Let's be clear, waste is money. The second thing is that we now have a low cost way to clean up electricity, which is called renewables, right? Um, if we were back here 15 years ago, I would say to you, well, listen, it's going to be really tough going forward. Um, the only alternative is onshore wind. Today, we've got offshore wind, huge capacity factors, and we've got solar at incredibly low cost. And I said, this is globally, it's the same situation. The third thing is, it is much easier to decarbonize electricity than hydrocarbon fuels. I mean, we go back 15 years ago, what we attempted to do was to replace some of our fuels with biofuels, right? But if you actually just look at the, not alone just the economics of, of the sustainability of it, it absolutely makes no sense, right? And I just put this as an example today, put you know a hectare of land, put a megawatt in solar of it, and you really, if you have an electric engine in place at the end, enough power for 81,000 kilometers of travel, I take the best climate in the world for producing ethanol and you get enough for a thousand, right? Two reasons for that. One is just the inefficiency of the, of, the, of the sun's energy being converted into a crop. Then secondly, you have to take that crop and burn it, right? So this is not sustainable, right? So that's why you say really hydrocarbon fuels, trying to decarbonize is really, really tough. Uh, again, electrification would be a reason why to do it. The next thing is just digitalization. Um, we're gonna to have to uh, invest more and more in our power system as it is. And think of it, I come from Ireland. If I look in Ireland, Power demand is really going up by probably in the next five years by 25%. It's all data centers, right? Use that as an opportunity to actually go and upgrade your power system. Use the waste heat from those data centers um, for district heating systems, et cetera, et cetera. So, and the fifth point I would say is just technology change in economics will push us to electrify. I mean, I think if you see transport, I look at transport, the electrification of transport is a given, right? Um, it's only just a matter of time, how fast we can actually do it. But it's, it's a given because of also at this point in time, technology change and economics. And I'm very clear, the exact same thing is going to happen in the heat. It's going to happen in heavy industry and so on. We have really the best minds in the world looking at how we can push forward innovation in, 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 in this area. And I just give you two examples of innovation. One is uh, just solar, which obviously this is, most of us know about this. But I've done a lot of work in this whole area of solar and technology in the last years. And I'd say in the last two years, I've seen more innovation than I've seen over the last 10. Um, and the innovation going forward is lower cost and greater module efficiency, right? And that means greater performance increases. 
Next thing is if I take the battery space, exact same thing. If I look at batteries going forward, lithium ion battery price is gonna continue going down. There's a whole pile of efficiency gains in and around production. And the other thing is that what you've got is again, similar to solar where you're looking to put thin film layers, do tandem cells and stuff like this in the battery space, also a huge pile of innovation. So moving to solid state batteries, uh, putting anodes on the, on, on, or sorry, silicon on the, on the anode side and batteries. What this means is greater energy density and also most importantly, a lifetime. This is really, really critical. If we can increase the lifetime of these batteries, we significantly drop the cost of them. However, and this is the but, and the but is that the power system that we have was not built for re intermittent renewables. And I just took this, this is the German power system last year. And if you could look at this closely, the black line at the, at the top uh, shows you the, the load. In other words, you know how much demand is. The yellow is solar, the green is wind, and then the gray then is a mixture of the fossil fuels and nuclear. And what, of course, what you see there is huge volatility in the prices. By the way, you can see down below is the prices. What happens is when you've got lots of sun, power prices go minus. And guess what? When the sun goes in, just at the moment it goes in, power price tend to go up. Now that's a really, really interesting opportunity, right? You could say for storage, but it's also a quite a big stress on the grid to be able to do this. And I will say the stresses are going to get increased going forward. So I just want to show this is um, something we did internally in Alexa Capital, which is just looking at Germany. I just want to focus on Germany. So Germany today has a situation where its, its peak intermittent renewable supply is bigger than its peak energy demand. So the reason that's important is because that's why you see these stresses here on this grid. You see them in Germany because of this. But if you look going forward, you're going to have a situation where Germany has twice its peak energy demand from intermittent renewables. And I go back to that. What does that mean in terms of minus pricing, right? Right. Just think of that. And by the way, you look at the other countries, you can see UK goes into the same situation and, uh, and other countries across Europe, you know, France, the exact same thing. So we suddenly have this volatility that's going to increase going forward. And this is just looking at California, just gives you an idea as how they see and in California. Gerard, yeah. Gerard, sorry to jump in. It seems that the slide is frozen. I think okay. a few people are saying that. Okay, one second here. Let me just stop it and just try again. All right. Who knows? Can you see that again? Not currently, no. The joys of technology. <laughs> um, I go again and try it again. How about that now? I can't see that, unfortunately. Yeah, hey, all right. Well, what I could do is let me just, let me just, tr give me a second. I know what I'm going to try. Go on, bear with me. I'll try and go out and in. Sorry, everybody. We'll get this sorted. Sorry, everybody, just bear with and we'll get Gerard back in. Hiya. Try again. Yes, let's try that again. The joys of technology. Okay. Yes, there we go. You can Very see good. That. Uh, so, so what I was saying here is this just gives you an idea of what happens uh, across Europe going forward. What happens is that suddenly we're in a situation by 2030 where variable renewables in term is a higher than the peak load in different countries. What this means is, is it means that we're going to end up with more stresses in our grid, okay? And I just give this example here, this is California. They've done a huge amount of mapping in and around what happens as you increase uh, solar, particularly in the system. You see what happens is you end up with the more you put on, the more 
power prices go on minus. I think this is a very, very, very important point because what this means is, it means that we have to store electricity, right? So I just want to talk about how do we, how do we store electricity? What this means is, if you look at storing electricity, we have two technologies that have been around for 100 years, pump storage, lead acid batteries, and there's a whole pile of other different technologies that offer ener different energy capacities, different durations, and, and have different strengths and weaknesses, okay? Interesting though for me is when I look is, if I look at batteries is really lithium ion is taking over from lead acid batteries. And I think we see this in our devices already, but really from a cost point of view, we are really at a crossover point right now. Um, and this is also spurring the whole market on. I, I also wanna say that my own perspective, I, I just counted all the devices I had in my home. I have 150 lithium ion batteries. I've got two, uh, sorry, we've got three uh, lead acid batteries and they're in our vehicles. I've got one in a tractor and, the, and the, in our two cars, right? But ultimately uh, it is lithium ion is all around us. How I want to say is, uh, is that the stationary storage is still small and immature. You think of it, it's a 4.6 gigawatt market. There's was 120 gigawatts of solar done last year, right? It's small, okay? Early stages in it. But the interesting thing is, look, going forward is, and we just took some of the forecasts from BNEF, HIS, IEA, put them together. You see what you've got is a very strong growing market in the next years. And I think I want to say to you, the reason for this is just because of low cost renewables and longer duration batteries, right? Costs, it's suddenly becoming, making actually like economic sense to use batteries in places where you wouldn't do them before. However, and I won't go into this slide detail, it is highly complex, okay? We were involved in selling, you know, the biggest battery portfolio in the UK that's come on the market last year. It is not easy, right? It really is not. And it's not clear what the revenue streams are, et cetera, et cetera, going forward. I must personally think my own view is that behind the meter is really interesting. I have batteries in my own home because simple, I'm, I'm generating electricity at 10 cents on my roof and I'm paying 30 cents for my electricity. Guess what? I use batteries to pay the meter. And I think what I think are very interesting about the behind the meter is you can just do more. I, as I said, I call it, it's like a Swiss army knife. I would also say though, going forward, it's very, very difficult in the battery space to, to bet against lithium ion. And the reason I say that is just because the scale of the ramp up going forward, if you think of it, battery, if you think uh, the, 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 the market for, for batteries this year, lithium ion is a hundred gigawatt hours of batteries. That's how big the market opportunity and, and, and the market is growing at 40% a year. That means next year it's 140 gigawatt hours, right? It's, I mean, this, the scale of what we're seeing is massive. And that means also that big firms which have warranties, et cetera, et cetera, the BYDs of this world um, uh, and so on. So I think it's very difficult to get against them. And I think the other thing that also lithium ion really does is it brings the utility and automobile value chain together. The example I try to give is, you know, 1 million Teslas, 100 gigawatt hours of power, peak needs of, the, of Germany and the Netherlands together, right? I mean, that is, you can't, can't, when you see that statistic, you sort of go, this has to have an impact um, on what's going on. And I want to say automobiles are redesigning their cars, right? If you go back to the generation one, it's very difficult to do second life with them. It's also very difficult to recycle them. They're, they're actually cost money to recycle them. But this, if you look at say something like the Volkswagen ID3, it's designed so it can be taken out of the battery and used for second life purposes, right? Delay the recycling, that's the, that's the key thing here because recycling is really a cost. Maybe at some point, it would become economic to actually take the materials out, but as it stands now, it's not, okay? So that means it's a problem for the automobile manufacturers. I also wanna say though, that there are alternatives to batteries. And I think the first one is just build better interconnection, right? So uh, this is just gives you an idea of wind in Europe. And you sort of look at this and go, well, actually it makes sense to be putting lots and lots of wind in the North Sea uh, off the coast of Ireland, but you know, does it really make sense to be putting wind in you know, Poland, right? Um, the exact same in solar, right? You look and say, well, we should be putting it more in the South, it's lower cost. But the other thing about it is that what you've got is wind patterns are different in different parts of the, of, 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 of the continent. You interconnect all this together and guess what? You can, you, you can actually put more intermittent renewables in the system. The second thing is digitalize. I think I said to you that I put a battery in my home. It's actually a silly thing to do. What I should have done, and it's much cheaper, is just connect my hot water tank up to the solar system because I'm actually heating with electricity anyway, so I'm buying it at 30 cents. Well, guess what? Use that solar on the roof, much more simple. And I, I use this as an example because what I am doing at home is I'm now putting more solar on my carport and I'm connecting everything up. 
so that that when the soul when that when their soul during the day guess what my car is powered and that's the, that's the world i'm going into is that you digitalize it that means you need to better use supply when it's there when you, when the supply is there use it as best we can and as a digitalization is a key thing to that I think I also say these heat pumps, right? I mean, heat pumps are over 100% efficient. What does that mean? One kilowatt of electricity, I get four kilowatt of heat out of it. Why? Because ultimately what I'm doing is, I'm, it's like a reverse refrigerator and I, I'm either using the heat in the ground or I'm, I'm using the heat from outside or vice versa, the cold. This is really, 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 really interesting, okay? And again, these can be intelligent systems that uh, become part of the solution rather than the problem. And the fourth thing is just power to X. Um, and, and ultimately power to X is just taking that excess power and creating something out of it. So that could be something like creating an e-fuel, it could be methanol, it, whatever it is, taking that and creating it into, into some other fuel. Now the issue here, be clear, is efficiencies are really low, which means costs are very, very high. And, it's, and so if you're gonna do anything, the first choice you're always gonna use is gonna use that lower cost thing. And the lower cost thing really is that battery because that battery is sitting in my car and uh, it's paid for already. I don't need to put new infrastructure in. So I'm very clear batteries, very important part of it. But I also see such technologies also having an important role going forward. And I finally, the thing I would say to you is we need to keep investing in innovation. We really are in early days in terms of batteries um, and storage capabilities. And there's gonna be a huge amount of innovation going forward. I think the next big thing for me is just moving to solid state batteries. Um, whether that's three years or five years away from commercialization, I'm not sure. But what I do know is batteries suddenly become safer, they'll become lower cost, and they'll increase performance and they'll, and they'll, and they'll last for longer. And that, again, you, you know, do this type of innovation, I think, is really critical to pushing this energy transition going forward. I'll stop there at this point in time. Apologies for the issue with the slides and for running over a bit of time because of the tech issues. I just want to just want to reiterate what Daryl said. Sorry, everybody, for the, the slight technology glitch. Uh, it sometimes happens. There's not much you can do about it, unfortunately. Uh, thank you so much, Daryl, uh, for the really, really interesting presentation. I just wanted to go back um, whilst we're waiting to see if anyone has any questions, just a reminder to put them uh, in the Zoom chat uh, or in the portal and we'll get them answered. Just go back to you were talking about Germany as an interesting market um, before we got kind of cut off. So, um, are there, maybe we can go into that in a bit more detail, or are there any, any other particularly interesting markets that you kind of see driving the- Well, well so, 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 so let's be clear, Germany is not an interesting market for storage because the regulations <laughs> don't allow it, okay? We, or not don't allow it, it's just the incentives are not there in place. It is very interesting for residential, uh, for residences because of the difference between the retail price. So I think one third of all our solar systems will have storage put on them on, on residences these days, right? It just, it makes total economic sense to be, to be doing that. However, if you look at large scale systems, right? Again, there's a whole pile, I won't go through all of it, but there's a whole pile of European countries where incentive structures, particularly in and around grid charges, just don't, 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 don't basically they prevent storage actually coming into being. The one exception being the UK, all right? The UK in terms of an, of a, an environment for allowing um, storage to flourish is an example to all other countries, right? Because it is really about regulation stopping storage coming into play. That's really mm -hmm. what it is. And uh, I think I, 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 what I realize is a lot of regulators and governments don't realize this. Um, so they, they, they think it's uh, all the economics of it are, are don't make sense or the, you know, there's, there's enough flexibility in the system, it's not. It's regulations are preventing storage. That's what I would say. Yeah, definitely. Regulation is key. We've actually got a session uh, later on um, as part of uh, the, the third day, so on the 2nd of March, just talking about the Iberian market and particularly how regulation is obviously, you know, one of the key, I guess, kind of barriers to storage implementation there. Um, so, yeah, that's um, I think that's that's all from me now. We've got another session coming up in about five minutes. Um, as we mentioned uh, at the beginning, I've just put the um, Gerard's email in the chat. So if you do want his presentation, he'd be happy to connect with you. Um, I've just re-entered the, the email there. Um, and yeah, I, I really, I, really I'll, like I'll answer Jerome's uh, question there, which is really, he asked, could you comment on the need for seasonal storage that can be performed by batteries? 
So my view, very practical view, is that you would let you let the market decide um, what, what's the best way to do it, uh, and you put the framework in to allow it. And I can say to you this, and I was in, we were in an interesting process of having selling a battery portfolio last year, and at the same time selling a backup power generation portfolio. And it was a really, really interesting process. Interesting to see the way the investors looked at both sides. And uh, I, I think the key thing is don't make uh, technology choices, but you know, governments really should just set the framework and then let us as, as an investors decide which wins. Um, my own view in terms of long-term seasonal storage is we have to be very practical about this. And I think, listen, we've got a gas network there already. We should be using it, right? That's, that would be my immediate reaction to it, you know? Great. Okay. Um, well, if we don't have any more last minute questions, I'll leave it there. Obviously, Jared will be happy to answer any questions, share his presentation, and uh, this will all be uh, on demand for anyone who wants to watch it back. Thank you so much, Jared. Okay. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.